Hello, everyone, and welcome. Happy Tuesday. Um, yeah, let's, there's 25 of us, let's get started. Um, I'm sure more people will be joining, um, but they know how these things work. So officially, hello everyone, and um, welcome to number webinar number three of this year. It's going so quickly. This one is Work and Life, Make the Dream a Reality, brought to you by Startups Magazine and Othership. And to celebrate issue number 19, which I'm super excited to say is our first issue focusing on workspaces, um, we've put together a jam-packed hour of insight, information, and hopefully a good debate for you. So we all know that the past year or so has been really difficult and really strange for everyone. Workspaces have been no exception and almost the whole world, um, you know, started working from home. Some co-working spaces had to close. However, this, this did kind of open the eyes to a lot of people that they no longer needed an office to work in every day. And remote working was actually a lot easier than everyone anticipated. So fingers crossed, we continue to see the world open back up more and more and people return into the co-working scene. And we even see the working landscape change um, with remote and flexible working taking off now more than it ever has. So this webinar aims to highlight all the different options and avenues that are when it comes to the work life. And kicking things off, um, we have the wonderful Ben, co-founder of Othership, who have actually written um, the inside the studio for the next upcoming issue, um, which is all about choosing the workspace that works best for you. Ben is pretty much an expert um, and he goes around all of them. So he's definitely the right person to speak to you about this. Um, we will then be joined by our wonderful panel, who again are all experts. Um, and I'll be grilling them all about the co-working industry and obviously how the past year or so has been for all of them. As usual, any questions, please pop them in the Q&A box. I'll also check the chat box um, and we can ask our experts once they finish speaking. Um, but for now, I will stop rambling on and I'm pleased to welcome Ben to your screens to you for the keynote. Hopefully this works. Um, and Ben, do you want me to share my screen? Yeah, I will do, Anna. And I have to apologise. Thank you for saying uh, incredible or amazing or whatever you said after I've been messing around for 15 minutes with uh, trying to do 4K streaming and everything. And uh, apologies for that. I'll come back to, to normal, normal things for everyone. So hi, everybody. Uh, great to meet you today and thank you very much to Anna for that introduction. If you can just go over Anna to the next slide please if that's okay. So as Anna briefly mentioned I'm one of the founders over at Othership and I'm going to talk to you a little bit today about how to go and choose the perfect office, something that many of us are thinking about and one of the things that we find is people really think about the tables, the chairs and the dollars, uh, or in today's case, the pounds. And we're gonna give you a couple of other things to think about. So Anna, if you could go down to about slide three, please. So when deciding how to choose the perfect office, it's really easy to think that I would come to this with a really substantial bias. The reason for that is around three years ago, my co-founder Arno and I both launched a service that would let people work from anywhere. But actually the case is we're not completely biased that people should work from anywhere because our goal is to encourage better working practices for everyone. And a few years ago, pre-coronavirus, not many of us were allowed to work flexibly and we've seen that change. So today I'll talk to you exactly as I said about some of the key aspects that can help you decide and at the end of the slides, we'll share them over with you and hopefully it will help you and your business think a little bit more about what you can do. We'll start by thinking about the business and how you can work here. We'll think about what you can do to be close to your customers, what you can do for your others, which are your colleagues, how you can look at company culture and around your neighbours as well. So if we can just go on to the next slide, Anna, we'll start by looking at the office and how you can think about your business. For me, I started life as an automotive engineer. I often needed access to vehicles to see what was actually going on firsthand. 
I'm sure that many of you listening will run businesses where being close to some sort of physical customer, a supplier, even facilities that you might use for manufacturing or other physical parts of your business are required. Now, there's quite a few ways around this actually. And we all know the example of Elon Musk. And when he decided to run Tesla, one of the things that really changed it from an automotive perspective was looking at how he could automate and roboticize his manufacturing line. He even acquired firms who could support him on this journey. For anyone who's seen those videos of an Amazon warehouse, imagine this in a car factory with fully roboticized. The investment into Tesla's future meant that engineers like myself, when I was back working at Nissan and Ford Motor Company, could view possible defects almost immediately with high resolution images where I slightly went wrong today. And you could even work with those robots to physically manipulate or inspect your part from wherever you were in the world. Now, this kind of investment into your future can make you a highly investable company and give you an unfair advantage, but obviously it's expensive to implement and is beneficial if you're looking at scaling out your operations to a global perspective. In this circumstance, it allows exactly, as I said, one engineer to quickly inspect parts from anywhere in the world. And it's actually much more efficient than putting one in each location who would then need to go and inspect. They'd need to take their own pictures. They'd email it all over the world and try to speak to each other, many of them speaking different languages, and then find and implement a solution. If you can move on to the next slide, please, if that's all right, Anna. So that gives some examples of how you can think about your business and how you can run it slightly differently through implementing various technologies to allow you to work remotely and not be required to the office as you thought you were. But then there's still this thought about your customers. A lot of us like to put our businesses close to where our customers are. One of the things that I've learned over my career going around into many different jobs is that knowing your customer and that customer centric design is actually one of the best practices that you can put into place. But sadly, even though we may build this, I've often seen that the employees in the business don't go and engage with those customers and not in a way to benefit them. We often sit behind our laptop, evaluating some of their analytics and digital analytics of how our business works. It's a lot comfier, it's a lot less scary. We can sit with our cup of coffee and, and we can do this from home or we can do this from our, our office. Or as my old boss used to like to say from your ivory tower, he was a big encourager of getting out on the ground and seeing what was going on. I like to use the example in the article I wrote about a gym manager. And when was the last time you really saw a gym manager come out and see why that cheaper treadmill that they bought kept on breaking or what you personally liked or didn't like about your gym. Like it never happens yet that manager's asked to go and work from that building every single day. So why is their office there? Well, I said I wouldn't be biased and um, before I go and say, hey, they should go and jump on a beach in Bali and start surfing and be able to go and do their work remotely. I think in this case, that's probably not the right idea, but there's lots of different things that you can do and try and put in place to allow them to engage more. I put some little quotes and examples down here of things where you could be putting on like a brunch uh, once a week or twice a week and asking your manager to come in twice a week. And that way you could be doing it and building some community across your members and it gives the staff an opportunity to engage. I also say that if your reason for putting your business is this physical proximity to your customer, then one of the things that you should do as almost every project manager will really suggest to you is to outline your benefits and then measure them. Before you even decide on where you're going to put that office, you're obviously working somewhere now, measure that benefit now before you go and make that decision. 
so you can actually see how it turns out. You can see if there are improvements to put in place. And it makes a substantial difference to knowing whether that decision was actually the right thing to do. So here the key evaluation point comes, do we need access to these physical parts of our business, whether it's our customers, our manufacturing line, or can you think of some more cost effective ways that maybe in the long run you can have fewer people access this same facility or same access from anywhere? Or are you going to be the type of business that has this hyper local strategy and therefore your local base is essential? This is definitely the case for some people. Again, I can look back at an automotive sector and you'll see catering. Catering should not go and expand and let all their employees work from everywhere. They have good access to good recruitment and good universities not far from London in the engineering base and they're a small facility that won't have global manufacturing. So it's really important to decide what type of business you're going to want to be. And hopefully that will drive some ingenuity and allow you to try and think of a better way to try and do things. So actually one of my favorite points is this next one. So it's culture. People talk loads about choosing their office for company culture. Almost as many companies you talk about putting the customer first will sit and talk about company culture. And I have a strange view on this. I had some recent exposure to a company called Palantir that some of you might know, one of the world's sort of most exciting growing businesses in the data science sector. And as I became more aware of this company, I really got to learn more about what company culture meant to them. And actually for them, it was a way of recruiting the best talent and having them stay dedicated to the business. And as you read and learn more about it, like many companies, you find that they have a culture page for their employment and tells them all about what your company culture is. But really, what do you think company culture is and how do you bring it about? So one of the case studies I put over on the side is Yahoo. People see Yahoo as a failed experiment in remote working. And lots of the reporters and onlookers cited that company culture and a lack of sort of productivity of people working remotely was why they pulled everyone back into the office in 2013. However, like many articles, it's only partially correct. And what actually happened was Marissa Mayer, who was the CEO at the time, and she's clearly stated afterwards, is these decisions were specific to Yahoo's challenges at that time. They found that productivity was actually higher with employees working remotely from the office. But what had happened, and the reason why they decided to go against this and bring everyone back into their building, was much more to do with the fact that they'd just gone through a reshuffle. The company was struggling. One CEO had lasted 130 days before leaving the business before Marissa Mayer came in. And actually, they were a company who'd scaled very rapidly. They had poor internal processes on how to collaborate across departments. And this meant that they were struggling to build that collaboration internally and internal knowledge that's important for large scale projects to succeed. It was also at a time when sort of stable video calls and collaboration tools was still a pipe dream. And it had nothing to do with building company culture or productivity. It was much more a process driven choice. So again, this comes back to when you're deciding your office, you need to think about the processes you're going to put in place alongside that culture. I also like the idea that we can learn from brand culture. Company culture often is defined as sort of a set of shared values, goals, attitudes, practices even, that characterize your organization and the employee's behavior and decisions within this organization. But actually that's not dissimilar at all 
to what a company would like to achieve with its customers when building brand loyalty, because that's what you are looking for. And I would then say, if you need an office, a fixed building to build brand loyalty, to bring culture, then actually maybe you have a more serious problem. than how to build culture. Maybe it's an understanding of what culture actually is, because we don't need to go into a building every day to understand what the positioning or the feeling we get when we engage with some of our favorite brands. What you should therefore think about probably is how that office becomes an extension of your brand and your company values. One of my favorite, favorite examples of this is the World, World Wildlife Fund. They have a proposition to make all of their workspaces sustainable. This is something that you can believe all of their workforce will engage with and believe in and is totally affiliated to with their core concept of what they're about as a company. There's another company, Zapier, one of my favorite businesses again in the world. Uh, they are out there for indie builders. That's how they started. And therefore, they pride themselves on working remotely. They have some fantastic articles and procedures and guidelines on how you can run your business and work remotely. And they even promote themselves over on Wikipedia. I think I have a link coming later as being what is termed a remote first business. If we could go to the next slide, please, Anna. So here, when I say think of the others, from us at Othership, we're mainly a community-based business. We are supporting some enterprises on their journey into flexible working. So for you, others is probably your colleagues who you're working with, the teams that you hire. And this is where life starts to get really tricky, actually. It's people's different requirements is, like in many other parts of life, where we get stuck. For every person that wants to work from home and they're lucky enough to be able to go to the south of France or have a second home somewhere in the shires, there might be a young graduate who's joined that team who would like the social opportunities that come with joining a company and working alongside other like-minded individuals. One of the stats that I show about this and the social impact that comes with work is actually across the US, one in four people today, and I think I actually said this at the last startups presentation I did as well, still meet their partner at work. That's in a world where in one swipe you can jump on Tinder and go and meet people, yet still 25% of us meet our life partners in our workplace. So how do you accommodate for this sort of variation? And this is where I say flexibility is key. This is where I am biased. I do think there are certain businesses where working in the same building every day has substantial benefits and is the right decision to make. I think there are other businesses that could go completely remote and benefit from this. And that's really up to each business, as I said before, and some of those key business decisions. But in terms of trying to be flexible, I think that really is important because that's going to affect how you're able to recruit. The old adage of one size fits all is absolutely not appropriate for when it comes to where we work from and how we choose to work. And the only way I can see that any company can get around this and having disgruntled employees and to attract that right talent is to have a flexible working policy. As I said earlier, there's the term remote first. And if you're gonna go remote first, you're gonna have to look at some of the feasibility of what this means to you. And as I said, change some of those working practices. However, what's far more common today is a hybrid model uh, where people are looking at some staff who will be working from a permanent building or their two to three days a week. And some people who may be fully remote, but also flexibly on the days that they're not coming to that building, having to find somewhere to work from either home or locally. So I suggest 
doing what probably many of you have done already, which is to try and see what they want, to try and understand where those proportions lie. So you've probably done a survey across your workforce. And I would imagine almost instantly you have found that there's that small group who want the office every single day and a really decent proportion of people who will want to move between the two states of working flexibly or remotely and working from an office. So the difficult question that we've been asked by Othership a lot or at Othership a lot is how do you actually accommodate this need? Uh, no one wants to pay for an office for 100 people and have sort of 30% of staff there full time. No one wants to have to, um, and you say, well, why don't you just go for an office for that 30%? Well, maybe 70% want to come in on a Thursday because they want some Thursday drinks and it's a sort of slightly more sociable day in the building. I used to work in a consultancy and we did this a lot on a Friday. It was a very sociable day to build some of that collaboration internally in the building. And that's a really hard challenge to try and accommodate. So you've probably been out and looking for a solution. I need to really find that there's a sort of lack of options in these. And how do you take a building that flexes from three to a hundred and back down again? Uh, you've probably gone into Google. You may have even ended up at this event that we're at today to try and see if there's a solution. Really is the bad news to say is there is no magic office uh, that magically moves its walls and goes from a fully private office of three people to a hundred people and back down again. The good news is there is some solution. So uh, there's services like us at Othership. Uh, there's a WeWork All Access Pass as well that exists. And these let you move flexibly around the different buildings and they have different degrees of flexibility within them for being able to take those private offices on demand. They generally let you and your team self-serve a bit more, providing quick access, access to workspaces and meeting rooms as well as private offices. And if you want to get people together on a regular basis, you can do this using meeting room bookings uh, that I've seen as part of some of the packages put together. You can even quite coolly find providers who'll list your own office. So that's another way to handle this solution. And you can manage your own office space and allow others in to come and use your own office space and reclaim some of that cost. And I'll actually go on to this a little bit further in one of the other slides coming up. And another thing is your team's pain points. We always talk about pain points when we're looking at customer centric design they might be easier to actually address than their requests. So this can be something to look at. Rather than ask people where they want to work, ask them how they want to work and why they want to work that way. You might find that people have been saying they want to come to an office every day because they don't have a suitable workspace at home. They might have been coming because they've had distractions or they might have been coming because of this sort of social isolation point. And actually there are other ways to resolve this and that's where flexible workspaces and some of the co-working spaces can come in because you've met their pain point without actually having to go and provide that full-time building of your own. Can we go to the next slide if that's all right, please, Anna? So the last thing that I'm actually going to cover today is just a sort of funny little concept of your neighbours. Uh, you can always think moving to the same street as someone you want to get to know uh, could be a good way to do this. I strongly recommend for romantic interests, you don't take this policy. <laughs> uh, there's a much better way. But when it comes to being associated with other businesses around you, people for a long time have taken postal addresses in London to sort of up the status or look of their business. And one of the examples I love about this is Google and Mozilla. It's actually really hard to find any articles. I would have put a nice little link in there to an article. So I invite you to go and search yourself. Um, there's a really good podcast called Land of the Giants that's done an analysis on Google recently. And one of the episodes discusses that relationship. 
when Google first started, uh, or Mozilla first started actually, they were across the road from the Google office and they built a really strong relationship with them. Obviously that relationship hasn't stayed happy all the way throughout, but actually there's new announcements in the press that they'll be going back together. Um, so do be aware if you choose where your office is based off your neighbors in the longer term, uh, it might not be the smartest strategy, uh, but it can be a great way to get affiliated with other companies who are on the same sort of journey as you and build those longer lasting partnerships. Silicon Valley is a really good example of this, uh, obviously, um, but there's other ways of doing this as well. So Vice Media, for anyone who knows Vice Media, used to allow other people to work in their co-working space uh, by making some of their office available. I talked about this earlier as one of the ways that you could reduce your office costs, but not only did it do this, they actually built such a good relationship with one of the businesses that worked there that they acquired them and it now makes up a substantial part of Vice Media's revenue. So it can be a fantastic way to get to know other businesses and bring new ideas into your own office space while managing your costs. For those who go to the fully remote option, you might think, okay, you have no neighbors. Uh, that's not true. There's some really cool companies out there. I've put a link into a Wikipedia page where you can go and see. Uh, Automatic, who's behind WordPress, they've been fully remote for a very long time. They have some really nice working practices that you can look at. Buffer, for anyone who's into their social media, they're a fully remote working business. Sapia, who I mentioned earlier, and us, uh, Othership. Uh, we all work together, uh, we share each other's tools and we collaborate with each other as remote first businesses. Uh, we have that type of neighborship, uh, neighbor uh, relationship with each other. If we could go over to the last slide, if that's okay. So I hope everyone uh, has enjoyed some slightly different thoughts uh, on how we look at things over at Othership. I've shared uh, with you some of the different criteria and we will put the presentation out with you. Uh, for anyone who's noticed and savvy, we do have an offer at the moment for our teams and members. So uh, in the presentation, there's a link to this. I'd love for you to come and check out what we're doing. We always try to make everything really flexible. So we'd like you to uh, come and just try. And that's why we're saying it's with a pledge to go and try one of our free workspaces uh, one day a week over the next 30 days. Uh, so thank you everyone. I know it's really scary taking these decisions, whether you're gonna go hybrid, remote first, or commit to that office. Uh, we're here to support you through on this fear. Uh, it's not as scary as you think, and as long as you stay really flexible in your decisions and don't commit to any longer term contracts, you should be able to navigate the next year or two pretty easily. So thank you very much, and I'll pass back to Anna. Amazing, thank you, Ben. Before you go, um, there was a couple of questions. Um, we've got one minute, so I'll ping them over to you uh, quickly, if that's okay. Um, our first question is, with everything that's happened over the last 18 months, and with the trends um, that are emerging around remote and flexible working, are there any arguments left to base a business 100% from the office? I mean, yes, I do think so. For the right type of company, I really do. So I would take, like I said, with Caterham as an example for this, I don't understand why Caterham would ever want to go fully remote. You would want your engineers to be seeing those cars, uh, to be working on them, even if they're doing CAD design, uh, a lot of the time, it's still nice to be able to employ locally, I guess, with that small size team and that sort of relationship to your product. If you're going to be a global scale business, no, I just I just don't understand why, you, why or how you could ever enforce that uh, anymore. So I think for some businesses, it will be right to do. Um, for other businesses, absolutely not. Yeah, I mean, every business is different, so like you say. Um, and finally, um, we have one more question. In your experience, how easy have businesses working under a traditional model pivoted and embraced the new normal? I mean, in my view, if I'm really honest, I have seen a lot of companies come out and say they will do it. And then we speak to their employees or we see their employees taking memberships with this other ship and they wouldn't be taking memberships on their personal cards if they had a su suitable solution for them. 
Um, and we don't see any large companies fully announcing this. It'll be interesting to see in the panel what other people are saying about this direction. But I think people are still scared to commit on a decision going forward. But publicly in the press, no one wants to be the CEO of Goldman Sachs at the moment. And, you know, you just can't get away with saying these things anymore. It was bad in 2013 for Marissa Mayer. It's absolutely disastrous publicly now to say that you, you won't be flexible. Yeah, interesting. Well, thank you so much, Ben. And um, anyone that obviously didn't catch um, the full presentation or Ben's details, we will include it all in the post event mailer and we will share everything on Ben and Other Ship. So we, yes, don't worry. But thank you, Ben. That was great. Thank you very much, Anna. Well, it is now time to invite my lovely panel to your screens. So, Please welcome, sorry, I'm just turning speaker view on. So please let me welcome to your screens, the lovely Kevin Smith from Boom and Partners, Henry Wilkinson from Rework and Josh Winfield from NatWest. Panel, thank you all very much for being here with us today. It's a pleasure to have you all on. Um, I won't do you justice giving you full intros, so I will back that job over to you. Um, tell us a little bit about, you know, yourselves, your job role um, and your company, just in a bit more detail. Henry, I'll uh, pass the back to you first. Hi, thanks, Anna. Um, so I'm Henry Wilkinson. Uh, I'm an area director at WeWork in London. So I basically cover about 26 of our buildings in London, which span from sort of Hoban area over to um, the city in, in Bank, essentially. Um, and we work, I'm sure a lot of you have heard of the company before, we're a flexible office provider, um, we've got about 800 locations worldwide, about 500,000 members worldwide, um, and in London we've got about 50, 50 or 60 buildings that, that we currently have open, so yeah. Amazing, thank you. We had um, a lot of our events that we work back in the days when we were actually allowed to host Amazing. events with you guys. <laughs> and hope, hopefully it'll start again soon. <laughs> exactly, fingers crossed. Um, wonderful, thank you, Henry. Uh, Kevin, please take centre stage. Hello to everyone. So uh, I run a business uh, consultancy, have done for a very long time, 1996, and we work with early stage businesses, helping them to grow in every way, totally sector agnostic. Uh, I personally am also a mentor at the UK's largest entrepreneur accelerator, and a mentor and guest lecturer uh, at CAS Business School. So one way or another, uh, we get to see hundreds of different early stage businesses. And over the last year or so in particular, we've had many, many conversations about growing spaces and where to work from and, and how all of that fits together. So uh, I'm looking forward to the chat uh, in a moment. Thank you very much, Kevin. Pleasure to have you on as always. And last but certainly not least, Josh, your turn. Thanks very much, Anna. Afternoon, everyone. Uh, yeah, I'm Josh Winfield. I'm a regional ecosystem manager for NatWest Enterprise. Uh, now, uh, regional ecosystem manager is definitely the bank's HR team doing their very best. Uh, but fundamentally, uh, I'm lucky enough to look after the enterprise team uh, for NatWest in the Midlands and the east of England. So a nice big chunk of the middle of the country. Um, and fundamentally, that means I get to look after our eight programmes of business support, one of which in the, in the focal point for today's discussion is our, our national accelerator programme, which we deliver via uh, 11 co-working locations across the UK. Uh, now, very much like Kevin was just saying, we're completely sector agnostic too, uh, that we're very much focused on the development of the individual with the view that if we can build a great entrepreneur, then the business is in safer hands because of it. So uh, yeah, really looking forward to the discussion uh, and, uh, and very nice to be here. Amazing, thank you, Josh. What a mix we have today. Um, and I'm looking forward to hearing all your opinions um, on our questions. So let's jump right in. My first question to you is, how important is it having flexible and remote co-working spaces for small businesses? And what sort of trends have you guys seen over the past five years or so, primarily before kind of COVID and the pandemic and all the changes hit? How, how had the landscape kind of been developing before that major blunder? Um, Kevin, I'll, I'll ask you this one first. Yeah, I mean, originally, mo most businesses start uh, either in a very small or, or a very flexible office, probably from home or something like that. And then they gradually grow. And traditionally, that was through 
you grow by getting some sort of workspace in, in a we work or something and then maybe a bigger workspace maybe not a service workspace but but at your own office but there was always that mindset that as you grew you got bigger and bigger and bigger offices and i think absolutely what's happened now when pre-covid whether it was a big company or a small company it was actually quite difficult to get employers typically to allow employees to work from home because of all the security risks, all of the um, whether you'd get the productivity, et cetera, et cetera. COVID obviously changed that totally. And now in pretty much all of the surveys you will ever read, whether it's Gartner, McKinsey, Deloitte, anybody, basically says that people want to work from home or from the office, whichever way you look at it, two or three days a week. So most people are looking for a mix. And uh, you've definitely got different challenges, as, as we were hearing earlier, in terms of that culture, in terms of building relationships between the teams. But there's now definitely a move where more companies, more early stage companies, are, are looking at working more remotely than they ever were before. You're on mute, Anna. Uh, yeah, it just popped up. I was trying to stop all the background noise, but you're doing something good and then it backfired. Um, yeah, I completely agree with that. And um, Henry, I want to back this one over to you now because, I mean, I haven't been in the, the startup uh, industry for, for years. Um, we were kind of born nearly three, four years ago now. Um, but to me, it seems like the, the entrepreneurial world and like co-working spaces was growing and growing and growing it was become big this this big up and coming sector um obviously before covid hit is that what you guys had found over the past say five ten years or so that it was like a uh, increasing growth yeah no definitely and i think uh, going back to WeWork's inception in 2010 it was very much built for startups and for a place for people that essentially don't want to take long-term commitments they don't want to go and they don't want to work from home or from a coffee shop. And back then, obviously, it was a lot harder than it is now. Um, and they wanted a space where they can go and work and be with like-minded people, collaborate, connect with them. So it was very much built from that. Obviously, WeWork is built into a far um, bigger beast than, than what it was back then. And now it essentially caters for everyone, from a startup to a massive enterprise client like the likes of HSBC or someone like that. And I think where you were originally, it was giving startups the ability to be with like-minded people. Where it's come to now, it's given everyone sort of that community of startups and bigger companies together. So you can be with people, whether it's someone else starting a company, you can chat to them having a coffee or after work or whatever and bounce ideas off them. But likewise, you can also see a bigger company in the same space. They may not have a big office there, but they may have like a 10 person office similar to your own and you can collaborate and, and sort of speak to them as well. So I think it's that collaboration and then also the ability to sort of pick and choose the space that they take with us, whether it's a small office, a big office, and they can sort of scale it up at the same time um, as they sort of grow with us. Yeah, yeah. definitely. And, and like you said there, it's about, you know, the, the togetherness. It's obviously the community. That's kind of part of co-working, isn't it? Um, especially for founders, you know, that are starting out or on their own, they can have that community feel and be with like, like-minded um, businessmen. Um, so Josh, with that in mind, um, again, the same question kind of applies to you. Had you seen this trend and this boom over the past five, 10 years? But then I want to add on to your question, how has the last year affected that community feel? And yeah, how has COVID been for, for you guys in your co-working spaces? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, to, to build on what Henry was just saying, you know, what we found as an increasing trend pre-COVID was this sort of admission really that had been missing from the enterprise space that being an entrepreneur is a lonely place right and if you're sat you know if you're sat in a in, in a kitchen or a bedroom which is where you know businesses start then one it can be very very demotivating particularly if you have a bad day or, or, or something like that and so a co-working space can provide that level of motivation or aspiration if you're sat next to somebody that you know that's spanking it it's you know it, it can be very very motivation it can go the other way too but the other thing that i think is really really important that a co-working space provides is it's very, very difficult to sit in a co-working space and just be a passenger. You know, you observe what other people are doing, you get inspired by it, but equally when you see other people's progress, it kind of can give you a real kick around 
I'm not, mo- you know, I'm not moving forward fast enough, or I'm, you know, I'm not moving forward, you know, plain and simple. And so what we found is that a lot of people were increasingly coming to us for that inspiration, yes, of working with other businesses and being able to network and feed off them, but also the inspiration to actually keep moving forward. It provided that extra level of productivity that, that working from home sometimes doesn't. Um, but to, you know, to answer the second part of your question, when COVID hit, we had to pivot and try and deliver a, a physical accelerator program digitally. Uh, and that was, you know, to begin with, that was really, really difficult because how do you foster those um, those random or, or chance conversations when you're going to a coffee machine or you're collecting your printing or something like that? And, you know, it's it's still an evolving feast. Have we got it completely right? No, probably not. But 12 months in, what we have done and, and the big thing that we took away from the co-working space was the importance of creating those chance encounters those abilities to 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 network off the cuff not with a particular agenda and so we've created things like drop-in sessions on uh, on zoom you know they they run at different points throughout the day people can go into different breakout rooms etc etc really just using the technology that's open and available to us but equally making sure you know whenever somebody comes onto our accelerator program we make sure that they're happy for, for us to share contact details and if i happen to have a conversation with Steve about a particular subject and I go oh I know Sarah would really really benefit from that conversation I just make that connection uh, apropos of nothing and everybody enters into our accelerator now with fully under the notion that we'll make introductions if we feel it's in the interest of the individual but that they're expected to 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 communicate as much as they possibly can again you know granted you can't you can take a horse to water you can't make it drink but it's been facilitating as many opportunities for communication as possible uh, really to in, in the last 12 months for us definitely and looking at kind of covid and workspaces and co-working to me it seems there's like kind of like two conversations to be having the first one is that well what happened to the co-working spaces did you all have to shut did everyone stop going to them did did the industry, did the ecosystem think, oh my goodness, what has happened? What are we going to do? And then on the flip side, like what Ben was speaking about is that this last year has shown that um, people don't need their, their, the big offices as much. Of course, some will, will always have their offices and they will still stick to that nine to five Monday to Friday. But a lot of people have realized that they can remote work, they can flexible work, they can work different hours, they don't have to be going to the same offices, they can be going into more co-working spaces, they can be going into different environments. So there seems to be kind of like two sides to, to COVID and workspaces. Um, Henry, obviously being a, a part of a massive workspace yourself, what kind of, what did, how did we work react to COVID and what angles did you guys see? No, it's, it's a great question. I think that's the way that I've always thought of this last year. You basically got two things going on. One is short-term health management, essentially. How do you look after your staff? How do you look after yourself? Um, and how do you keep working throughout that all? But the second question, which I guess is the wider topic that we're addressing now, is how do we all want to work forever? And we're all talking short-term at the moment, but fundamentally we're re-evaluating how we all want to work like forevermore. It's a, it's a huge shake-up. Uh, in the short term, obviously, like everyone else, it was completely unprecedented um and we had a big dilemma ourselves as to what to do like we had to keep our own staff healthy and safe we had to keep our members healthy and safe but we also realized that we had um we had to stay open for our members as well because you had a lot of essential workers who needed to come into the office and work during that period so we essentially spent a hell of a lot of money globally on putting covid measures throughout our buildings so making them covid secure signage distancing face masks all the stuff that we've all now come to expect mm-hmm. and we did that very quickly i think what was helped or what helped us was we got a lot of insights from china and what happened out there so we could react in europe a lot quicker once the pandemic sort of started to spread our way and what we saw was obviously footfall decreased massively during the height of lockdowns we still saw people coming into the buildings and what's, what we've seen since as the world starting to unlock is the startup and the smb segment are the ones that are really starting to come back first i think a lot of what you see in the press and a lot of the pr is about the bigger companies what are google amazon what are they doing for their future of work but the reality is they can really accommodate for their staff at home they can spend a lot on home tech and ergonomic chairs and all this type of stuff a lot of the smaller companies don't have that benefit and they need someone to come and work to collaborate and to connect. So we start to see their workforce come back first. So that's sort of been the way that COVID's worked over the last year. But looking forward, I think it's what we've all been speaking about and what we read about the whole time in the press, which is that flexibility, that hybrid way of working. 
and the realization that the office of before COVID isn't going to be the office of post COVID. And everyone's going to have this flexible way of working. Do they want to work at home? Do they want to work in their head office? Do they want to work in a remote office somewhere? And allowing that flexibility is what we've really pivoted to over the last year. So now if you're at WeWork, you can rent a desk for an hour. You can rent a whole building for 10 years if you wanted to. So whatever you want, you can come to us and it allows that real flexibility between home and essentially the office with the office being like whatever people want it to be. It could be a collaboration space. It could be meeting rooms. It could be the old desks that you would go and sit there. But I think everyone really wants that sense of purpose when they go to the office now. They want to know that they're going for a reason, going for those social connections and really going to meet their colleagues to, to achieve something. So, yeah. That is flexible working, being flexible. Like exactly. you've hit the nail on the head there. <laughs> <laughs> Um, we um, we did a poll with our community and we asked if they would prefer to work at home or work in office and 64% answered saying they preferred home. Uh, Kevin, from what you've seen and you know your experiences, do you think this reflects the whole entrepreneurial industry? Do you think that's kind of an accurate um, sort of figure and do you think that COVID has changed this figure? Yeah, I mean, that, that fits, well, it, it depends quite how you want to look at that. But that fits very neatly with what I was saying a moment ago about the, the big studies from, from the McKinsey's and the Gartner's of the world. And that was all saying two thirds, so 64%. But, but it would work from home some of the time. People seem to love the, the flexibility, the idea of not having to get the, the work in an office in centre of a big city from nine to five and, and the hour commute in each direction and all of that. And, and being able to, as I say, work from home and whether that means dropping the kids off at school or whatever, they like some of that, but likewise, they're missing, in my experience, they're missing that, that human uh, interaction, that connectivity, that chatting with people, getting inspiration from people, the, the sitting together, as Josh was saying, and just being spurred along by others. And so sitting at home and working, especially if you've got a young family and you've got dogs barking and young children screaming and you're trying to do all of that is, is a very difficult space. And sometimes it's much better to get out and get into uh, some sort of proper office. Now, again, whether that's a, a big office in a main city or whether that's a much smaller hub, more local to you, to some extent doesn't matter, you're getting some of those benefits, but, but people seem to be wanting elements of both. And again, if you come back to what life was like before and what life is like now, and more importantly, where will it be in five years time? The, there was a lot of talk about the new normal at the beginning of, um, of the whole COVID situation about a year ago. And where that new normal is going to be quite whatever that looks like is it's going to be a mix the best the businesses that are going to do the best are going to be those that will keep some of the elements that have worked that they found has worked exceedingly well during lockdown whether that's different customer services whether they're selling more online whatever it happens to be they're going to keep some of that but they're also now got the ability to go back and do what they were doing before and so therefore the best business model will be using elements of, of old and new as it were and mixing that together so why should that be any different for for workspaces workspaces are going to be a mixture of old and new old five five days a week nine to five in the office new working from home so if you actually mix those two together you've got an element of both and, and I really think that's where it's going to be and what people want. And it's where people are actually more productive because they're able to have that work-life balance makes it sound as though you're relaxing more. It doesn't necessarily mean that. It means being able to easily go to the dentist and work from home that day or the plumber's got to come around or whatever it is, as opposed to having to beg the boss to, to have the day off and not take it as a day's holiday. And, and that's how life has changed. I think you're right. I think most people do want to mix. I think um, when COVID hit, a lot of people hadn't worked from home at all. Um, and so this was a, a, a new experience for a lot of people. And going forward, the majority of people do want a mix, but the odd person is like, absolutely not. Working from home was not from me. Give me the office every day. 
And the other person is like, oh my goodness, like working from home is the best. I can wear my pajamas every single day. You know, I can work 10 till six and no one will really know. Like, and it's a, it's a, everyone's different. So it's, there's no right and wrong answer for anyone, is there? Um, Josh and Henry, obviously you both have um, co-working spaces um, and obviously Henry, you have touched on this a little bit, but how flexible are you guys and how flexible are the hours that you guys are open and offer? Do most businesses that you work with still want to work that nine to five hour slots or is it kind of like all over the place? Are you guys a lot more flexible? Uh, Josh, I'll ask you first and then ask Henry. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I should caveat what I'm about to say. Well, again, we are still currently shut. Uh, unfortunately, we are, we are, we are, um, re, we are re-oiling that machine and getting it ready to reopen. Obviously, in line with uh, June the 21st, hopefully, and and we'd be hopeful that you know quite soon after that we'll be throwing the doors open once again. Um, but to answer your question directly, um, uh, nine of our eleven hubs are open 24/7 and have uh you know the usual sort of shower facilities and all that kind of stuff you know if people are cycling into work or whatever and that kind of stuff we do say you know you can't sleep here and we do enforce that but that you know that's just about it so 24 7 offers that flexibility of working and certainly um what we found is the pattern of behavior was that the, the hub was you know our hubs are pretty quiet in the morning until sort of 10 11 o'clock and then they are busy and you know at the, the consistency within our hubs is that the coaches that work there um, work there sort of in a more of a nine to five pattern. And certainly when the coaches leave at five thirty, six o'clock in the evening, the hub is buzzing, you know, and it's continuing to buzz until eight, eight thirty, at which point people are starting to, to file out. So, yeah, I, I you know, we used to see that people still work eight, nine, ten hour days. But we, we found that entrepreneurs were start the ones that we were supporting are starting sort of 10, 11 in the morning and, and working their way through into the evening. That, that's what we found largely. Definitely. Uh, Henry, I'm, I'm pretty sure I know the answer, but I'm going to ban it over to you anyway. And, yeah. and add on that um, we asked our community again, and 90% of them said that they wanted flexible working. So assuming you're going to tell me you're fully flexible, um, but do you also see the office hours, the, the nine to five being a thing of the past, and now kind of flexible working and 24 hours is going to be the new normal going forward? Yeah, no, definitely. I think... Um... Yeah, similar to Josh, so our buildings are 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days a year. So people can come and use the buildings whenever they want to. I think the nature of the flexible workspace, like industry and, um, and what we sort of offer, we had seen changing patterns even before COVID. So it wasn't necessarily a nine to five, like a traditional office. People are working in a much more flexible way. I think now what we're seeing is nine to five is still the core hours, but there's definitely, to Josh's point, like when we an analyze the footfall data, a lot of difference in some people coming in early, leaving at lunchtime. Some people may start the day at home, do a meeting at eight or nine and come in at say 10 o'clock. So we're starting to see that sort of shift in how people use the space. I think the core hours, like that core of the day will still remain the same because people want to be in together. They want that feeling. They want that sort of um, social interaction. But as we see the flexibility build more and more with work, with home, with different office space to work from, um, that variety in the in the schedule is is really going to start to come come forward. I think definitely, and obviously talking about flexibility and, and twenty four hours, um, one of my kind of questions um, and topics that we've also been asking is about um, hotels because obviously they're open uh, twenty four hours. Um, not necessarily the, the restaurant areas, but still hotels are open 24 hours. Um, and we've seen um, a number of people start w working up hotels more. How, how have you guys um, seen this across kind of your community? Have you seen um, more people uh, working out of hotels? And do you see like workspaces kind of competing with them? Is, is that a thing that we can expect to see more of in the future? Uh, sorry, I didn't ask anyone. Kevin, shall we go to you for this one? <laughs> Yeah, from my side, I think that people are interested in different workspaces, comfortable workspaces. It depends what you're trying to do, whether you're wanting a workspace uh, to use as effectively as an office or, or, a, or a meeting room, or whether it's a workspace you just want to sit somewhere quiet, quiet, convivial, um, with some nice surroundings. Coffee shops, you know, just don't really work. Too much noise, too much uh, backgrounds if you're trying to have any Skype calls or or indeed you annoying other people if you're trying to have too many Skype or telephone conversations but to tuck yourself away somewhere quiet in in a hotel uh, area is is often much much better 
um, because they're not as formal, uh, they're not as um, uh, utilitarian almost as, as some sort of simple offices can be. So you can sort of, let's, let's say, lounge around a bit more, but, but you can relax a bit more and you can get there and you can get on and work and you can have face-to-face -face meetings. So I, I do think hotels, just like everybody else, are going to be looking for different ways of, of maximising this okay, so, so the world has changed, we've got to adapt and, and uh, our model and what bits of, of the old or can we sort of lose or change. And so I think it is all going to be part of people are not going to want to be going into big city centres all the time. So they're going to be looking for more local workspaces. Um, so I think you're going to see more local hubs opening up. So whether that's a we work opening up a, a much smaller office or whether it's some um, much smaller setup opening literally three in, in a few towns around where they are, but nevertheless a little chain. Um, but, but I've had lots of conversations with businesses that are looking at doing that sort of thing. Um, so I think you're gonna see a whole combination of things and it just depends what, what you as a business are trying to achieve. And, and again, you as a business are going to probably want to access all of those different things at different stages. So big offices with that whole communal spirit in, in the center of big cities some days, um, local ones other days, more, more cozy, comfortable hotels other days. So, so I do think it really is going to be that whole mix and match thing. Definitely. Um, our results showed 47% uh, of our audience said that they previously worked out of a hotel but I mean maybe we'll see this this number continue to grow um Henry do you ever see um hotels as kind of like a competitor to workspaces and is it something that your community have spoken about much at all uh I wouldn't necessarily see it as a competitor I think but I think what it does show is what the office needs to provide someone in terms of if people have the hotel as an option so at WeWork, for example, we've now got an all-access product, which I think Ben touched on during his presentation, which essentially allows someone to sign up for a WeWork membership, get a black card, and then access any WeWork in the world. And that, I think, which is what I think you're alluding to with the hotel sort of option, is that true flexibility of footprint, allowing someone to work from wherever. You could do a morning in West London, the afternoon in East London, and then go near to your home and work there in the evening if you wanted to. So the WeWork card allows you to do that. But I think it's also, and this sort of comes to the ethos of what WeWork's been around about since we, since we first um, started, it's about the design of the office and what is that actually providing. And it's having those breakout spaces for people to relax and lounge around in if they want to. It's going into meeting rooms. It's having more formal settings. And I think we can certainly look at the hotel offering and say, why would someone want to go to a hotel and what would we not be offering? I don't believe we are not offering any of that because we have the design, the amenities, the community sort of feel. So I think I wouldn't say they're, they're a competitor, but there's definitely learnings from the hotel, which, which I think could be taken. Definitely. And you kind of answered my next question in the answer as well. So that's amazing. <laughs> I'll, uh, I'll back that one over to Josh and add on to it. Um, obviously, if you've got any input, Josh, um, then obviously about the hotels, please jump in. But also I want to ask you about how important location is of a workspace. I know Henry just said that we work offer that kind of flexibility and you've got we works all over the place. So location for you guys is important and you've kind of hit that nail on the head. But for workspaces of smaller scale and, and of yourselves as well, do you think that a location of a workspace is important? And also, do you think that the commute sometimes puts people off? Yeah, absolutely. And that is something that, you know, we've been very entrepreneurial in that. And as much as we've made as many mistakes as, as others, you know, in terms of where we've put hubs. Uh, so to begin, you know, I think that's typified by our Birmingham hub at the minute. So we used to have, uh, for those of you that are familiar with the geography of the city, we used to have our hub right in the centre of town within a two minute walk from two of the main train stations. Um, but it was tired. You know, it was bank upon bank of beach, you know, beach effect desks, and it wasn't particularly inspiring. And so we spent seven figures on kitting out a state of the art accelerator hub at our other building in Birmingham, which was a 15 minute walk from the train station. And whilst it's a fantastic space, and I am dying to get back in there, although I'm absolutely sure somebody will have left the bottle of milk in the fridge in February last year, um, you know, I'll have to sort that out. But um, people just don't, you know, we, we, we saw people just did not necessarily we expected it to be full and were quite naive about that because you know 
if it's in the middle of November and it's minus one and it's raining, you're not going to walk 15 minutes from the centre of town, having commuted into the centre of town as well. And so we've had to we've had to learn that. Um, and so we are trying to make our locations much more commutable if they are in the city centres. And I'm quite interested to see where we go post COVID now, because you're right, this the last 14 months has taught people they don't necessarily need to be in a city centre location to be successful. Um, and so I think NatWest have an ongoing challenge around what they do with their branches. Controversial. I don't want to have a conversation about banks and branches here. Um, but, you know, th there are a lot of branch spaces that, you know, that are owned by the, the banks. So why not turn them into local co-working spaces? You know, in you know, I live in Kidderminster, so why not put the, the NatWest branch in Kidderminster as a, as a co-working space and so on? So I, I think there's a lot of work to do. But to answer your question directly, no, I don't think it's um, I don't think that big city centre location has an importance anymore. Anna, can I, can I just jump in quickly on the flip side of that? I've spoken to a number of local authorities and others that are looking at trying to help co-working spaces get involved in their local community. And there's actually been a number of surveys done. Again, I think it was Gartner, but, but one of the really big players that pointed out that most people, when they go somewhere to work, want to be within a two minute walk of somewhere they can go and buy sandwiches and a coffee. And that experience means that if you're putting a location somewhere that's very nice in a more rural area and it's got a car park and all the rest of it, you might think that's a perfect location, but actually it's not because you can't nip out at lunchtime and go and buy your sandwiches and have a little look at a few shops and that sort of stuff. So, so that whole getting that position right is exactly right. And it isn't about big cities, it's just about being somewhere that you can go out and do and get a bit of a breath of fresh air and, and do something at lunchtime. I think it's back to the point we were saying earlier about how everyone's different. So you can have all these different options and some are going to please some and some are going to please another because you can't, one location probably won't please everyone because everyone has different criteria and um, options. But yeah, I couldn't agree more. I'm very conscious of time and I believe we've lost Josh. Don't feel ping back on. Um, but I've still got you two wonderful uh, panelists. So I'm going to wrap it up, but I'm going to ask you one final question. So let's make it maybe short and sweet. Um, what do you guys envisage as the future of work and the future of workspaces? I know it's been a turmoil time and we've kind of covered all the aspects. But yeah, just to finish on, what do you see in the future? Henry, I will start with you. Yeah, so I think building on the themes of today, it's very much that hybrid way of working with flexibility at the core. I think it's flexibility in place, space and time. I think it's people coming to an office for a reason. They want collaboration, they want social, action, social interaction, and essentially they want productivity at the end of it. I think that's what's been missing from everyone working at home. And so the future is going to be that full flexibility in how everyone works and where they work from. Hit the nail on the head. And Kevin? Well, as you said, keep it short and sweet. And, and the fact that Henry's just hit the nail on the head, I'm not sure if I've got much more to, to add, but, but absolutely it, it's going to be flexible. And, and in my experience, if you work with people, if you help them uh, and put them, help them with what they want, you're going to get as an employer, whether you're big or small, you're going to get much more back in return as well. So just finding something that works for everybody. Um, and, and as we've said, there is no magic building, there is no magic location. So finding what works for everybody means that whole flexible approach. Perfect. I couldn't have asked for a better, a better panel, panellists um, and answers. So a massive thank you to you all. I could sit here and chat to you for hours, but I'm conscious we've taken up everyone's time. We've even lost a panellist. Um, but no, thank you so much for your knowledge and insight today. Again, a massive thank you to Ben and Othership for partnering with us on this event. A huge, huge thank you to Henry, Kevin, and a shout out to Josh, wherever you may be right now. Uh, if you want to read more on workspaces and I need to add in EdTech, the latest issue is out this week. And we obviously look at workspaces and we talk to some EdTech startups. And I'm really sorry I didn't get any time to ask your questions because I was babbling on. But if you want me to connect you with any of today's keynote panelists um, or any of the speakers, give us a shout and um, you can find some more information in the post event mailer as well. So thank you as always for joining our webinar. Pleasure to have you. Hope to see you, some of you in person at the Hustle Awards in July. 
Um, but for now, thank you very much. Thank you to my team and see you all again soon. Thanks, Anna. Thanks very much. Thank Bye. you all. Bye.